So I know most of you, but um, for anybody who doesn't know me, I'm Bonnie Powers. I work with Academic Technology, which is a university-wide department that supports all faculty and academic staff on instructional software like Zoom and um, Sakai and Google Docs and the kinds of things you use in your teaching and learning. Um, not just actual classes, but anything you really use with students. Today's presentation, or rather workshop, we're going to be working together, is on increasing student engagement in remote classes. And we'll also talk about what's worn it, what worked in your in-classroom sessions and see if there are ways that we can translate some of those things in uh, online uh, environment. So we're a small group. Feel free to unmute yourself and stop and ask a question. There will be some opportunities to participate um, in the session today. So if you happen to have a cell phone or a tablet handy, or if you have a second screen or screen where you can open up a browser window, you'll have the opportunity to answer some online questions and participate in making a word cloud and sharing your ideas online. So when we talk about um, student engagement, uh, we've been researching the, the language of student engagement as defined in the Universal Design for Learning guidelines that are run by cast.org. And they describe their principles of student engagement as recruiting interest, sustaining effort and persistence, and self-regulation. Um, under each of those areas, there are some sub bullet points, which we're going to be seeing later. But if you want to pull up the UDL guidelines, I'll be showing them in a minute. But here's the link. And I can actually put that in the chat in case anybody wants to go there on their own or later. You'll see on each of the slides I'm presenting, there's the opportunity for you to heart it or throw up a question mark or a thumbs up or a thumbs down. The way that you would interact with my presentation is by going to menti.com on your phone in a little web browser or on your tablet or on your second screen if you want to. And it'll just need this six digit code. It'll pull up my presentation as I'm presenting. And when we come to a slide that's interactive, well, they're all interactive because you can click on these four icons in the bottom of your slide to indicate what you're thinking about as we're talking. Um, but when we come to a more interactive slide, it'll pop up with a question that you can answer. So this is what the guidelines look like. They have a full grid of nine of uh, three principles with each of these being a guideline. And today we're looking at providing multiple means of engagement getting student, students engaged and keeping students engaged in your educational material. So recruiting interest and sustaining effort and persistence and self-regulation are the guidelines I was referring to later, earlier. And these are the, the checkpoints within each guideline. So if you uh, have your mentee pulled up, this is a response question. What student behaviors indicate to you that students aren't engaged in the moment or during asynchronous work? You can respond to any way. What are the barriers in assessing student engagement and in remote teaching? So um, I'm going to participate too on my phone by opening menti.com. And if anybody has any questions, as you, yep, as you submit your answers, you're going to see we're going to be generating a group word cloud. If you see a word that you want to duplicate, you can put it in. You can enter as many times as you want, or there's 10 words, and then you can resubmit multiple times if you want as well. So let's all work together in menti.com, putting in the code 73. Eight four six four, and Thank you. 
And this is a tool that you can use for free, Mentimeter. It allows you to do uh, two interactive slides, question slides like this. Um, there are several varieties. You can do five quiz slides, so students could participate in a uh, five quiz questions during each presentation. And then you have slides that are headings, bullets, images, and things like that. So you could present uh, a whole presentation. And if you want to get around that limit of two interactive questions like this, you can have multiple presentations during a class. You just go through your first presentation and then you'd start your second one and it just might have a different ID. So students could do that. So you can see uh, with what people are typing in. Um, and as we build this, and, I, and I'll let it keep going for a while, um, this response is saved in my Mentimeter account so I can download it. You all, if you were interested in capturing this right now, could toss up your camera for your, um, from your iPhone or from your laptop and take a quick picture of it. Um, or something like that. And so if we, the more people who put in similar turns, um, oh, that's a good one, closing your video. You'll see that the, the word clouds grow based on how many times a word has been put in. So I just uh, liked the one closed video and I put it in myself. So that one is put in twice as many times as some of the other ones. Silence. Yeah. So you can control, you can give students options. You can only put in one word, you can only put in three words, you can you can control what they do. So I'm going to move on to the next slide unless anyone uh, has a couple of more things that they want to put in. So I like a lot of this uh, lack of eye contact, smiling for no reason, non-responsive. A lot of this is about perceiving a response or not perceiving a response or what we think the response is based on only seeing someone's face and not seeing a lot of other body language or on the faces that are paused, not being able to see any facial expression or um, or, or body language or anything like that. So this might be uh, to encourage engagement in your class, you might request that unless there is some sort of technical difficulty or background reason why someone can't, you might ask that people keep their video on during your session. Now, if you're recording a session, sometimes people are camera shy and don't really wanna be recorded. And so that's one of the main reasons what people will turn off their video um, so it may be that you choose uh, that engagement in your actually, actual class means not recording the class so that people meet, feel more comfortable leaving their video on or something like that. I'll let you guys have access to this slide uh, afterwards. So if you want to keep those answers for yourself. So in the recruiting interest guideline, the sub bullet points are optimizing individual choice and autonomy, optimizing relevance and authenticity, and minimizing threats and distractions. So I see someone hearted it. Um, I find this one kind of easy to address. Um, in this time, there are a lot of threats and distractions. And so maybe uh, in this case, we can't always minimize them, but we can acknowledge them and let people know that uh, we know that there are threats and distractions in their lives right now and that they're not going to be penalized for those. And that can help minimize um, how much difficulty those threats and distractions pose to a student. If you can optimize or give some students some choice of uh, how they view the reading material, uh, what the reading material is and how relevant it is, um, that sort of thing, 
it's another way of keeping students engaged. And then optimizing relevance. You know, I was working with a faculty member from New England this morning, and one of her reading assignments was to find an additional website or journal article that illustrated a point in her conservation biology class that was meaningful to the student. So in addition to having the readings that she wanted them to read, she allowed them to find and share something that was meaningful to them um, to recruit their interest. Does anybody have any other thoughts about ways that you might do that? Uh, Laura, is that you were having a little trouble hearing you. Okay, and um, Jim wrote, can students do private chat during class? Yes, okay, and Laura's having trouble with her mic. So yeah, feel free to put anything in the chat and I'll try to keep an idea. Anna. Go ahead, Shira. Yeah, Bonnie, I've, I find that um, asking people to bring in examples from their practice, I'm seeing people when they are already in a training program and they have clients to bring in clients and re relate that to the reading really seems to mm -hmm. help. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, and Lisa, you raised your um, hand. Uh, yeah, I think um, just every... Um, asking a student to kind of help um, monitor questions from other students, kind of delegating someone to join me. It's mm -hmm. a small thing, but it, it can help. Yeah, I mean, and thereby it acknowledges that our new environment is difficult for us to manage in a, in a way that's different than the classroom. And we're saying, I can't be the leader and the speaker and manage the chat at the same time. Can somebody help me? Yeah, and I noticed here that you were not able to chat with everyone, and I wonder if that was a choice by you, because you wanted people to ask their questions, or uh, if that was I've just inadvertent. You. No, that's gone from last time. So now I've changed the chat so that everyone can publicly and privately chat. Sorry about that. That's what Jim's question was about, and I was, about, and I was a little confused by it. All right. So we'll, we can come back to this as well. Um, the second guideline is sustaining effort and persistence. So I find these uh, supportive of the first ones, heightening the salience of goals and objectives, uh, varying demands and resources to optimize challenge, fostering collaboration and community, and increasing mastery-oriented feedback. Um, we've just launched a new uh, template that we're letting people use in Sakai and uh, one of the ways that we have tried to achieve heightening the salience of goals and objectives is to have a learning objectives section on our weekly lessons or on our lesson modules in Sakai so that students understand what we're asking of them on a weekly basis. Our, so all of our syllabi have course objectives but we don't always share with students the weekly learning objectives um, to make it more clear what we're asking of them. Are there, are there any others of these that you think um, can be easily addressed in the online env environment or ways that you do it in your classroom? Lisa. Can you just clarify the increase mastery oriented feedback? What do you mean by that? So mastery oriented feedback would be not just the correct answer to a question, but why that answer is correct or where they might find more information about a correct answer so that they actually learn something about what they've got wrong. It might not be related to a correct answer, incorrect answer, but not simply the right or wrong, but a, a more deeply yes. meaningful feedback mm -hmm. that will move them forward. Thank you.
I've recently learned in the Science of Wellbeing, a course I'm taking online in Coursera, that people achieve more happiness when the activities they are doing provide some challenge. Not too much challenge and not too little challenge. I think our lives are a little bit challenging right now. And so challenge can be overwhelming, but if you're varying the demands or if you can clarify what the demands and challenges are, people might be able to get into that optimum space where they can feel challenged but not overwhelmed. And we're going to come back to fostering collaboration and community at the end because I think a lot of what we're doing, uh, a lot of what has been challenging about remote learning is developing that collaboration and community place uh, while we're all under stress and using new tools that are maybe uh, we're not as experienced with or that make it a little difficult to really connect with people. So the third guideline is self-regulation. Um, and we often think of this more in the way of younger students or students who might come in less prepared. But I think right now um, with the overwhelm, people might need some prompts to help with self-regulation to uh, promote the expectation and belief that you can learn this you know, the growth mindset versus a fixed mindset um, and facilitating some personal coping skills and strategies, which might come about as we set norms in a class to say, our class is small, it's intimate, it's important. So uh, let's leave our videos on whenever you can. Feel free to unmute yourself and stay unmuted so that you can participate uh, in an integrated way. Or if you have distractions in the back of your house going on behind you and you need to, just let us know that so that we know you're engaged but not, um, not able to show your screen. Because as we saw in that little word uh, chart that we did, our perception of what is happening when a person turns off their video might be different than what's actually the reason that they chose to turn off their video. Um, and then develop some self-assessment and reflection. And that might not be in the moment, in the synchronous meeting, it might be uh, on an asynchronous task that we offer people to do. Debbie, you're unmuted. Did you happen to have a question? Oh, I'm sorry, I'll mute myself. No, no, you're okay. That. I just wanted to make sure that oh. you, you didn't want to share Oh, something. thank you. I joined late, so I'm just listening in. Okay. Thank you. I'm trying to and, find my mute button. Sorry, I'm on my phone, so it's a little Oh, no worries. Yeah, tap your video, and then it should be in the lower left oh, content. Perfect. Thank you. And Carolyn wrote in the chat, I think building community is key and one of the ways to ensure engagement. I'm taking a class this year that was already a virtual class. Shattering the instructor in the winter was great and I saw how participation in the forums and regular emails to the students made a difference in building connections. And Laura asked, so how do we gauge the appropriate rigor of the challenges? Rigor is one of those questions that come up when we try to apply UDL in a higher education classroom. Um, people think uh, that in K-12 perhaps we are, it's more needed that we give them scaffolds uh, to get up to where they're supposed to be and that students of a certain age uh, should be responsible for their own self-regulation. Uh, I think that's true, and this might be something, and I don't think that was question was just in regards to self-regulation, but 
I think the rigor of the scaffolds and the instructions that we give are really, um, especially during COVID right now, in support of people's mental health and stress so that they can participate fully. Um, some of the assumptions we, we have in place uh, about what's going on in people's lives may keep us from giving them the support or instruction or maybe additional help and supports that they need. But I think that rigor is a great conversation for us to have. Does anybody else want to comment on where they see this line between rigor and the supports in, in helping boost student engagement? Uh, that's kind of a, a, a challenging one for want of a better word because when you're doing classes face to face, that's something that you almost do uh, instinctively one on one or in small groups and uh, in the online environment. I mean, I think we all know or have a sense of what the appropriate rigor content wise and learning objective wise is for our classes, but in terms of how what students are dealing with uh individually or familially or whatever um uh, i don't know how we would gauge that i think in some ways um we think of scaffolds uh, and things, that, the way that we're gonna support our class is if people have an accommodation and they require, for example, let's just say in the example of giving students different ways to access the material that you've offered. Um, some students require that a text be, let's say, read aloud so that they can access it. And if that's uh, required for that student, and it's easy to make accessible, why not make it available to everyone? So that could help someone, for example, with a, a visual impairment, but it could also help someone who has to commute long distances and can only, uh, you know, has time in their car to listen to a text or something like that. Um, it would help not only people with disabilities, but people with other barriers and limitations. So when we remove a barrier, um maybe that's where the definition is if we are removing a barrier to learning we're not spoon feeding them we're not letting them take the easy way out we're letting them access the learning in the way that fits in their life uh, in a useful way so closed captions for example like i know that a lot of us have created videos that don't have closed captions and ADA guidelines would prefer that we do that for all of our classes. It, it's a little extra work. Zoom actually is pretty good at it and we can talk about that. But if you are showing a video in Zoom and you are working with a third year class that has sort of a low quality internet connection or sharing an internet connection with their family who's at home with them right now, captions may be the only way they can really comprehend what's going on in a video you're showing because the video may be choppy and the audio may be choppy but the closed captions at least are stable on the screen and they can read them and see the content of what's happening so in that case we're not scaffolding for a disability but for the reality of people's lives right now um, and that doesn't decrease the rigor of the material by sharing the, um, the closed caption version. Um, it does increase the engagement that you can have in a class with people who might have a lower uh, internet speed and therefore a barrier to their learning, a barrier. So if we think of these things as the things we do to take down barriers that might affect multiple kinds of students um, versus, um, 
just simply making it easier for them. Maybe that's where that, uh, there is this, am I, am I losing any rigor in this experience by removing this barrier for all students? Go ahead, Stephen. You're still muted. Yeah, I think that the idea of uh, rigor or challenge is related back to this uh, notion of learning community. Because I think, you know, in a, in a good uh, community, we're all responsible. So we have contributions that we make, each one of us, including the, the teacher. And then, but we're also accountable to one another. So the, the instructor is accountable and the various uh, uh, so-called students or other participants are accountable. And then collectively over time, I think what, what I, I really value is that this, this, the standard gets moved up because we're given feedback to one another, not only verbally, but also in writing. Have you thought about this? Or maybe you could produce that next time. And, for presentations or even, you know, on matters of related discussion. So that it just keeps kind of moving up. And recently at the end of the class, the quality of the work was so good, I thought it was potentially publishable. So we're now working after the class on a project, but it, that notion of accountability to one another in a learning community, I think that's where the rigor or the challenge comes in. That's a really good point. You know, if you are trying to build community and have really in-depth discussions, um, and if some of the challenge in a Zoom room is taking up class time, then maybe uh, providing materials in advance, providing materials in different ways so that the students can access the content in advance or easily will allow them the time and the ability to be challenged by the material and bring that challenge to the course rather than the challenge be in getting to the material itself. And so they can spend their time in that uh, higher level learning space of digesting the content and uh, discussing the content and not just the difficulty of reading the content or uh, listening to the content or what it is. All right, so this is another interactive slide if you want to jump on your phone um, or whatever device you might use. What do you do in your regular classroom to recruit self-interest to sustain effort and persistence and help with self-regulation? And if you have ideas for how that might turn over, we're gonna keep talking about that. Feel free to throw up some challenges you have here or some things that work effectively in the face-to-face -face classroom that we might think about how we can reuse or repurpose in the online classroom. While you're thinking about that, Carolyn wrote, live captions are almost impossible. Um, uh, and that is true. Uh, it can be a little bit challenging. I will say Zoom has a live captioning tool. You just have to have a live person to be typing the captions. Uh, so if you have access to, I know there are a lot of students with work study who can't work on campus now, but if you could have a work study student in your class be assigned to type live captions in Zoom, you could do that for part of all of your class. If you are looking for closed captioning for a video, if you record it in Zoom, Zoom takes the audio and turns it into a text transcript, which you can attach to your video in YouTube to do automatic after the fact closed captions. That's the difference between live captions and closed captions. So there's also um, an interpretation feature if you need an interpreter, if you have a person who can interpret. Debbie, was that you? Yeah, so um, I, I haven't taught yet on Zoom, I'm about to, but one of the things that's been helpful when I've taught in regular classrooms is using the whiteboard to take a case, and then I do a genogram, I do relational patterns, we do a lot of kind of brainstorming about who's involved with the family and then interventions, and 
Um, I find that that writing process, engaging the students as a group, they usually really love that kind of activity. So I bought a pen that I'm planning to use with my laptop screen that hopefully will help me to be able to like draw a genogram on my laptop. But I didn't know if other people had suggestions for how to use that whiteboard feature, because I think that's really crucial in, in, in engagement. So uh, you can use the whiteboard feature. You could even, if there is sort of a base template for a genogram, like there is for a bell curve, you could do those sorts of things in a blank open Word document and start with the Word document, a Google Doc, a picture of the generic version, and then you could add the detail with the annotation tools that you can use in the whiteboard, which would be arrows and text and lines and things like that. They might not be as neat and perfect as they are in a regular handwritten dry erase whiteboard, um, right. But you can also save those and the students send them to the students after the fact so they can actually have snapshots of the whiteboard. Right, except sometimes I'm using their cases in real time and it, so it's not always the same thing. Okay. I find a lot of engagement comes from the live, like, like their placement cases or someone that they know that they're interested in talking about and just kind of comes out more naturally in the discussion in the classroom and then I use the whiteboard to illustrate. Um, but that's a good idea. I don't know how to, I'd have to learn how to use the word in the annotation and do all of that. I don't know how to do that yet. Okay. So while I'm sharing my screen, you guys have a menu at the top. It says view options. Under the view options, there's an annotate feature and that turns on the annotation toolbar for you. You are welcome to practice with it um, on my slides. Um, and your drawings will not affect my presentation itself, but they'll be drawing on top of. So if someone had a question about one of these, if you wanted to put a star, for example, if I thought uh, I stand in front of students who are not engaging, walking around the room helps, and you want to do that under the stamp tool in the annotate toolbars, you could put a star on that to sort of vote for it, or a little heart to say, yes, that's a great idea. You can also use the drawing tool, a thick line or a thin line to underline or highlight or circle the things. And this is the, so I was saying, I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with the diagram type, but if you had to do your little bell curve, if you had something to start with as a base layer, it could be the plain whiteboard, but it could also be a presentation if, if there was some sort of template underneath. So I see people drawing stars and making lines and using the stamps tool to put a star on it. So this is another way of engaging people using these annotation uh, toolbar when you're sharing your screen or even when a student is sharing their screen. So for example, there is a also a question mark in the stamp tools. If someone didn't quite understand and I could say, oh, it looks like someone has a question about who wrote Maximize Student Choice, incorporate interactive activities and individual reflection. Did someone want to address that? So you can use these annotation toolbars. Go ahead, Shira. So Bonnie, a star came up on one of them accidentally. I had my cursor over that space. And when you said star and you put the star up there, somehow a star went down there. Well, this is not just me. This is all the students in the class right now are annotating on top of my slide. Okay, to, to so sort of vote. somebody else may have drawn that even yes, so I had put okay. Yep. so we're all co annotating. We're all collaborating on a presentation. This could be the whiteboard. This could be a blank Google document. It could be anything that we could draw on top of. Um, but it allows people to collaborate together in real time. And not have to have one note taker or something like that. So um, I, as the host, and I'm just gonna, I can clear all the drawings. I can clear, I'll clear my drawings first. And then I'll say, all right, everybody, I'm gonna clear all of the drawings so we can start over. And now if anybody wants to start their favorite suggestion that's up here, please do that. Oops. 
All right, have breakout rooms is getting stars. Having students take turn leading the group in movement and mindfulness is getting stars. I like, I invite them to write on the board, which is what we're all doing now. You know, we can all share the board in this way. So that's just a demonstration of the, the annotation. And you'll see as long as uh, people keep adding things to this uh, slide, we will, slow, we will be able to scroll down and see them all. Mentimeter.com is collecting this information so I don't have to remember it. Um, I can download this data later and share it with people, everything that we've, we've done together on this particular question. And there are several other uh, types of interactive slides. Small groups, two to three to discuss, and then we all write report back. So we could tie this to the other two who wrote breakout rooms uh, to show that. I definitely see that the, the comfort level is much higher in breakout rooms when people are in small groups. I see people's shoulders creep up or they don't talk or they mute their video. The minute you put people into a breakout room of three or four or five people, videos are on, people are chatting, everybody's unmuted, everybody's relaxed, because um, we're so used to being in the more formal environment. And that breakout room really changes the feeling. And this is also one way you can do shared notes in a breakout room. Debbie, is that you? Yeah, I have a question. So um, in the breakout rooms, how does the instructor move like, how could I enter and join and observe for a while in one and then move to the other one? I wasn't sure about that. Yeah. Once they're assigned. We have a great tutorial. When you open the breakout rooms, they are listed on the breakout rooms uh, dialog box. Um, I don't have any breakout mm -hmm. rooms open right now, but let me see if I can drag this over. Can you guys see this? The group A and group two? So I've yeah. created created yeah. the breakout rooms. I can assign whoever I want to whichever breakout room. Okay. When I hit open these rooms, that number four will turn to the word join and this number three will turn to the word join so that you can join oh. either one of those breakout rooms at the time. And then my video pops in with them so that they see me there with them. Yes, you can't, okay. nobody That's can great. secretly join a breakout room. Um, okay, good. Yeah. All right, because I've seen people comment into a breakout room just with text commenting, but I wasn't sure about like jumping in with video. You can only comment in a breakout room if you're actually in there with your video. Your video doesn't have to be on. It could be like Jonathan's where it just shows his name or like Beth's where it just shows her photo, but you are actually in that room. You actually leave the main room and you go into a breakout room. You can't be in two places at once and you can't communicate with both groups at once. That makes sense. Okay, if I'm thank sharing you. my screen, you can't in the main room, the people in the breakout rooms can't see it. But you do bring the history of your chat with you when you go into the breakout room. So you could still see the links that the instructor had provided. Um, that's the only thing that comes with you into the breakout room. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. So how can we make direct instruction more engaging in the remote classroom, either synchronous and or asynchronously? Um, announcements, which uh, you probably do both in real time in your classroom. You can also do in Sakai via email, uh, via announcements. And so if you're struggling with not having enough time to accomplish all your tasks in your synchronous time meetings, perhaps you can prioritize differently to do the things that need to be synchronous in a synchronous way and allow some of the other stuff to happen in an asynchronous way. Um, if you have a unit introduction, do you need to do a 10 minute introductory lecture in your class or can you throw that on a quick Zoom and let them watch it before class and then discuss it when you get to class. The same thing with demonstration videos. Obviously, people aren't going to sit there and read the material in their class. Can they devour some of your material <laughs> asynchronously and then use the valuable community and collaboration time together more effectively? Um, by getting into the higher level discussions and sharing, you know, the responsibilities that we have 
to each other that Stephen was talking about. All right, I'm gonna just clear these annotations because as you see, did those come over from the last page or are those new? All right. So uh, some ways of building that community. Go ahead, Shira. Funny. I'm sorry, I just got a little confused. Were the annotations part of Mentimeter or are they part of Zoom or is Zoom part of Mentimeter? Okay, that's a good question. Okay. All right, like, so yeah. the annotation toolbar is part of the screen sharing tools in Zoom. You can turn it on for just your, it's on automatically for everybody. You can turn it off so students can't annotate. If you don't tell them about it, most people don't know about it. So if you instruct people to annotate or, and show them where to find the tool, then they can annotate. Now, Mentimeter is a totally separate tool and I'm just sharing you my Mentimeter presentation just as if it was a um, Google slideshow or a PowerPoint or something like that, totally separate product. The annotation tools that uh, Mentimeter offers are different depending on the slide type. So on most slides, you can have this heart, thumbs up, thumbs down or a question mark. Um, and that's the only way you can annotate in Menti, and you do that through your second device or your second monitor or something like that. Um, you can also annotate through Zoom on top of this if I happen to say, love this idea, and put a bunch of hearts next to it. Or ask you to do that. So I think this goes to uh, reducing threats allowing for some time before class or after class or outside of class for to check in on people uh, for them to check in on each other for you to check in on them um, i do feel like we're all stressed there's a ton of time we're losing but that the time valuably spent in in finding out how your students are doing uh, how's your internet connection are you sharing it with i mean just knowing things about their situation really fosters that community and collaboration that you know you're part of a team and um, their challenges are your challenges or at least you may not be able to fix them but you can be understanding of them um, someone mentioned this mentioning questions and comments from their work to show them that you're engaged and you recognize the work that they've done in other places. I think uh, Alison Henry talked about this from her Waldorf intensive. She would read their journals from the day before and she would read out uh, a comment or, or a question that came up and she would just see the students light up. Not, they, she didn't say their names necessarily, but just the recognition that somebody had heard what they had said and thought it was valuable or heard and thought it was worth asking the class about really helped engage students in the conversation uh, to wake people up out of that, maybe the slumber or the, the not paying attention that you're seeing in their video or if they have their video turned off, it's hard to see that, but. I'm just gonna clear so that when we go to the next slide. Oops. Um, the other thing is, I we find this really challenging. There are so many tools out there that we can use, and this is a teeny tiny list. Um, but someone recently suggested on a webinar that tools that create a space for engagement are the kind of tools that students and faculty and support staff and all of us like to use. Not the tool for the, the sake of using the tool, but how can we use a tool to foster that community, that collaboration, that engagement? Um, and there are some very simple free tools uh, like Sky and Zoom, that they're just really meant for that. Those are the obvious two. But using Google Docs or Sheets for people to collaborate on, for example, in breakout room notes or in doing a shared presentation or 
what if taking shared class notes that, um, you know, if people could engage a little better during class, if they knew that the whole collection of students could collaborate on these notes and put something together that they could see later. Uh, we have a whole uh, seminar or workshop that we did on how to use docs and sheets and slides with Zoom and Sakai. So I can, the link is on our YouTube channel. Um, we'll probably do it again in a month or two. Um, but it creates some real collaboration because people can create their ideas and put them down. They can comment on each other I, other's ideas. If you're in a group, uh, you can put group A's notes, group B's notes, and group C's notes all in the same sheet. And group A and B, although they're in different breakout rooms, can see what group C has been writing and maybe what they're talking about and get some inspiration from that, even though they're not part of a conversation. Or you could separate them so that they had to share them after the fact. Um, we are looking at VoiceThread right now, which is a video discussion board, and it allows you to do video presentations and a whole bunch of other things so that people can see your faces and hear your voice when you make a comment, and so that the students can comment back in the same way with their video and audio, or just audio. Um, Padlet and Wakelet. They're basically little interactive websites where you can put together some questions and lots of people can respond to them and then you can go back to them to see what the people have responded. It's, you could do the same thing in a Google Sheet or Google Doc. Uh, Symbaloo is a link sharing software. Let me see if I can pull up my Symbaloo account. It's a grid of little squares where you can create uh, collections of links that might be related to your course materials, course topics, things like that. And you can open them up to be shared with other people so that you can share the same one. So Symbaloo looks like this. So you can have a Symbaloo board that might be for your counseling and therapy class or for your psych statistics class where different people could add different links and you can cluster them into uh, sections that should go together. Then it, it ends up being a resource for students. You can embed it in your Sakai course just by having your Symbaloo link. Um, and this is a polling tool like Mentimeter. I mean, I'm not saying Mentimeter is the best thing since sliced bread or the only or best polling tool at all. Zoom has an internal polling tool that only allows you to do um, multiple choice and you can do multiple answer within multiple choice, but you can't let people type in. So that's why I wanted to demonstrate something like Mentimeter today, which allowed people to do a more visual activity like a word cloud or um, to type in their comments. Um, that you can work from as sort of a discussion board. It also acts as a reminder for what did we want to talk about next? Everybody, a brainstorming platform. So you can brainstorm the questions that you have or the topics that we should discuss. And this is a tip I think you can never go wrong, especially online. The typical rule of thumb, they say, is that if you ask a question and you want people to respond, to give at least eight seconds in the classroom of silent time to wait for people to formulate their response, get the courage to speak up and do so. In the online environment, it takes longer. So you can double that time that you wait or you can encourage people to use the chat at different ways of interacting. Um, people have to unmute themselves, maybe stop their video, wait to see if they're supposed to be called on, or if they're just supposed to open up their mic and start talking when you ask the question. There's a lot of, uh, there can be a lot of lack of clarity about what you want when you ask a question out loud. Is it rhetorical? Are you really waiting for responses? So if you can give that eight count or that 16 count to give people a chance to reflect um, and then answer, that's a great idea. Or giving them ways like the, the reactions in your bottom toolbar or the nonverbal feedback in your participants menu to give feedback that's not audio feedback.
and then we can brainstorm other ideas about how can we make our indirect instruction more engaging. Readings and videos, projects and papers. Um, can you allow them to use uh, group projects? Janet Robertson in New England's Clinical Mental Health Counseling Program has a classic discussion forum on Sakai, but she also allows students, you know, busy student, don't have time to get together with others, type in your answer to the discussion forum, post and reply to other people. But her alternative choice for them is get together in a group in Zoom and discuss the reading, make a recording by hitting the record button and paste that recording into the forum posting in lieu of your post and your response with approximately 10 to 15 minutes per student that's in the discussion. So if there's three students, it would be a 30 minute to 45 minute Zoom posting, Zoom recording. And you know, how much more engaging is that to be talking about the concepts of what you read? Oh, I thought it said this, I thought it said this, and posting that instead of your forum discussion. But if you just don't have the freedom in your life because you have to feed your family or um, you're on a different time zone or something like that, you still have the option to complete the assignment in the traditional way and engage more in a, in a text-based forum. We talked about offering course materials in multiple ways. And uh, we can talk more about how to do this in, in other lessons or off the clock if you want to, if you need help creating closed captions for your videos or text of your lecture or something like that. We talked about showing the weekly learning objectives in Sakai so students knew what you were expecting of them, what they were, what you were really trying to teach them. Do they have to write yet another three page APA formatted paper because that's a learning objective? Or are you just trying to get them to demonstrate what they've learned in the reading? And could they do it in a different way that's more engaging? Um, to create a diagram illustration or presentation on what you learned about today's reading instead of yet another five page, three page APA formatted paper. I mean, granted, if your learning objective for that week is to teach them how to write an APA formatted paper, then yes, that may be the right assignment. But if you can allow some choice, some flexibility, allow them to um, put some of their own relevance into their work. If it were me, I mean, I have a background in developing websites. I do not want to take a master's program where I'm going to sit there and write three and five page papers all the time. I want to build a website that's going to teach people about educational frameworks and I want it to be live so that other people can say it or I want to do a blog on educational frameworks to demonstrate that I've learned what you know we're teaching in my class. It's relevant to me. It's more engaging to me. I can get responses on my blog. I can share my content with people in a useful way. If I write a paper for a class, I'd have to repurpose it. To, to use it again. So if you can allow any sort of choice in that way. And then a million and one ways that we can try to foster more collaboration and more community. So I want to I want to open it up to everybody. Um, what I'll do right now is uh, stop the recording and we can just have a discussion of some more questions and I'll make this available to people. As always, if you have any questions, just email us at at antioch.edu.